Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Zilks. It was good to see you in Austin. Kriya Artem, Tony Glass, and new patron Mike. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Mike. Good to have you. On this episode of DTNS, the EU's DMA popularizes small browsers. Scott reads the tea leaves on Xbox forward compatibility and why China is easing up on video games. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. My friends, we have a lot of gaming news for you today and a little not gaming news for you today and all of Scott Johnson. Oh, uh, well, part of... <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I meant, you are a wonderland. I meant, we've established you're enti- this. You're entirely here. All of you is here. <laughs> that is yeah. true. All uh, 84.5% of my normal self is here, and I'm glad okay. to be here. Very good. Very yeah. good. Uh, and considering you're 70% or so water, you know, that's... It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Could be Let's no, start no, with the Now hits. I'm like... Oh, <laughs> Record 10 Kobo announced two new color ink e-readers, the Kobo Libra Color and the Kobo Clara Color. Both use e-ink Kaleido Screen Tech, which offers 150 uh, uh, PPT in color, with the, which The Verge describes as a pastel hues. The Libra Color is compatible with the Kobo Stylus 2, sold separately. That costs $220. The Kobo Clara Color offers 16 gigs of storage and improved processor for $150. Both are IPX8 waterproof, and both Color ink, e-ink readers are available to order now, shipping in April, coming to a beach near you. Mm, Kobo Libra, please. Uh, Piper Sandler survey found out that 33% of teens in the U.S. own a VR device, and that's up from 31% last year. Weekly use has risen from 10 to 13% of people using it at least once a week. That's not what I would call an Apple Vision Pro Halo, although a lot of stories are working hard to try to say it is. But hey, it's still pointed up, right? Uh, the survey of U.S. teens also found out that TikTok is still the favorite app of teens in the U.S., but Instagram has actually moved into second place above Snapchat. Snapchat got kicked over to third. Uh, finally, teens spend 29% of daily video consumption on Netflix and only 27% on YouTube. Hmm. You know, I really would have thought YouTube would have been the larger of the two. Yeah. Security researchers at SOC Radar discovered a Microsoft public storage server on Azure was left open without password protection. It contained code, scripts, and configuration files containing passwords, keys, and credentials used by Microsoft employees. The researchers notified Microsoft on February 6th, and Microsoft secured the files on March 5th. Nintendo shut down servers supporting the Nintendo Wii U console on Monday. Uh, and yes, there are some people who are still using it. So a group of open source coders created the Pretendo network to give those who wanted to keep using their Wii U a little bit of a workaround. Now, originally, you needed to jailbreak the Wii U to access it, which, you know, a lot of these folks were going to do. That's that's fine. But not all of them wanted to do that. So Tuesday, Pretendo announced a workaround. Uh, you need to make a DNS change on your Wii U, but you can use the stock firmware. You don't need to jailbreak it. So it's easier, even if you don't mind jailbreaking. Uh, the workaround was discovered thanks to an SSL exploit discovered by Pretendo de- developer Shutterbug. Third-party titles that use their own SSL won't work if you do it this way. So no watchdogs or YouTube. Uh, and of course, if Nintendo pushes out a firmware update for the Wii U, it could remove the bug and therefore the workaround. I really like the name Pretendo. Me too. Oh, that's pretty yeah. awesome. It just, yeah. it just works. Yep. The march of AI service announcements shows no signs of slowing and continues this week. Google announced two new coding tools. We have Gemini Code Assist that can handle 22 different programming languages, including debugging and explaining, part of Gemini for Google Cloud. And Code Gemma is Google's own code in Python, JavaScript, and Java all in one. There are three versions, one of which can work locally. OpenAI announced that GPT-4 Turbo with Vision is now generally available through its API. That means third parties can take advantage of OpenAI's newest and most capable model in their apps. That means practically they won't need to call separate models for generating text and images at this point. Very nice. All right, before we get into the big news, 
I don't usually call out titles from the live chat while we're recording the main show, but uh, Fred819 just submitted Your Scotty is a Wonderland. Oh, wow. All right. I no, My mom calls me that. That's fine. That's <laughs> <laughs> fine. It's all fine here. I, I like how fine. Scott's like politely like, yeah, that it works. He's like, yeah, I, I don't mind being compared to the John Mayer song, but Scotty. Yeah. Don't love don't that. Know. Don't love it's that. So much. Oh, Scotty. Yeah. Oh. Uh, all right. China requires foreign companies to partner with domestic companies in a lot of situations. One of those situations is game distribution. You want to publish a game in China, you got to partner up with a Chinese company that can navigate all of the restrictions and approvals and such and such. During a crackdown on gaming over the past couple of years, Blizzard and NetEase couldn't come to an agreement on renewing their relationship to do just that. And therefore, most Blizzard games stopped being distributed in China on January 23rd, 2023. So it's been more than a year since you could legally get most Blizzard games. There is an exception for Diablo Immortal, which was actually covered by a separate agreement. But otherwise, you're out of luck. Microsoft, however, says it has reached an agreement to once again distribute Blizzard games like Overwatch, Diablo, and World of Warcraft in China. Phil Spencer wrote on X that Microsoft is, quote, exploring ways to bring more new titles to Xbox, demonstrates our commitment to bringing more games to more players around the world. Look at us. We're not doing those things you accused us of when we bought Blizzard. Uh, Scott, uh, you, you know, you've been following Blizzard closely for 20 years or whatever. Um, what do you make of Microsoft being able to come in and ease the tensions? Because, like, there were some high tensions between NetEase and Blizzard around the time that they ended that deal. Yeah, it was pretty ugly, actually. They tore down a Overwatch statue in China at the offices of NetEase to symbolize the breaking of this deal. And they filmed it, and it went viral, and it was a big mess um it basically looked like when you when you tear down a giant statue that probably costs i don't know a fair amount of money to build and put up uh that felt it's like, like a fin- taliban stuff yeah it's kind of <laughs> final it felt like a final nail in the coffin to me hmm. um but in light of the new acquisition and microsoft's desire to expand into other markets which they've already been doing in every other way why wouldn't they do it here i'm sure that they stepped in with a bit of a a fig leaf and said, look, guys, um, maybe we can put that statue to back back together. At the very least, can we just get contracts back in place where, you know, we'll give a little bit and you guys can have back what you liked about having us over there and then everything will be fine. I, I think that is probably what happened. And I think it is a positive move for them if they want the, you know, more of that market over there. Um, the Chinese market in general, though, has been a little touch and go in the last few years, like a lot of new regulations and a lot of new stuff causing develop both developers, publishers outside and in to hit the skids a little bit on a whole bunch of projects. So this isn't that unusual for a bunch of stuff to fall apart. The weird part is it's coming back together. Well, yeah. and some, you know, restrictions on especially younger folks and how long they can game in any given day, you know, that all plays into it. I would say that at least on paper, it sounds like, you know, the consumer wins here. Uh, NetEase and Microsoft coming back to an agreement saying, yeah, you know, all right, World of Warcraft folks and, you know, you know, Blizzard folks in general can now enjoy games um, in China. And we want to work together to, you know, bring more titles uh, to NetEase. You know, I, 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 I'm looking for holes in the story, but it sounds like it's just two companies getting along better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, where Dami asked, there wasn't another company who could do it. That's an interesting question. Like, why didn't Blizzard just go somewhere else? I wonder how much of it was hoping that they could rebuild the relationship at a later date and not have to start over from scratch because there's a lot that goes into creating the distribution networks for this. Yeah. Um, and how much of it might have been, you know, a little bit of being blackballed of like, well, you're not going to work with Metis, you're not working with anybody else. I think that's probably, there's some truth to that. I also think your first point is probably the more accurate one or, or the one that that had the most bearing here. Um, working with Netties was something they were already used to doing. They had systems in place and infrastructure in place that probably hasn't left. Like it's probably still sort of just been there doing its thing, running other games, whatever. And Eddie's is pretty big. Uh, and there are other choices who Tencent, Tencent already has a little stake in everybody, including a little bit of Blizzard. Although I, I don't know what that changed with Microsoft's acquisition, how that actually plays out. Um, but NetEase is probably still the best choice 
uh, for them to go with. And if if my inside sources are to be believed, uh, Diablo Immortal makes more money than any of it ever did. So in a way, this is like saying, well, we're already the cash cow, which no one thinks of, but mobile is the cash cow, uh, is already happening over there. And it's going great, don't you think, fellas? And they're all like, yeah, uh, I'm making this up, of course. And then they say, well, why don't we bring all our stuff back into the fold? And they said, you know what? Why not? New leadership, new management. Let's do this. Uh, and, you know, rumors were that there was a very particular executive that they did not like back then. One like, NetEase exec exec called one of the Blizzard execs a jerk, but didn't yeah. say which one. So yeah. The the other thing, this is all happening around the background of, of <laughs> an a lot easing of jerk up. Executive. <laughs> uh, yeah, how could you tell? Uh, this is all happening around the background of of the easing up of game restrictions. Uh, like like Sarah alluded to, the, you know, there's a rule that says you can only play an hour on Fridays and weekends if you're under 18, and you can only play 90 minutes uh, Monday through Thursday if you're under 18. They were going to restrict that even farther uh, in December, and there was a backlash. MIT Technology Review has a really interesting interview with Angela Hui Zhang, a law professor in Hong Kong, who said she thinks the investment community overacts to these announcements and Chinese governmental agencies use the fact that they will overreact to punish companies without having to actually punish the company. In other words, you want to punish some game companies and get them in line? announce that you're going to put in restrictions and investors will start pulling out. It will punish the company and therefore you can get them to play ball without actually having to pass a new policy. Uh, I think that we're not seeing that anymore, says uh, the law professor Zhang, that because there is an economic downturn in China. And so the agencies don't want to be seen as hurting the economy by scaring off investors. And so we're seeing a little of that softening. I thought that was an interesting theory for why that's happening. Yep. I think she's got a point. Well, the Digital Markets Act, which went into effect in the EU on March 7th, forced Google and Microsoft and Apple, among other things, to make it easier for consumers to switch to alternative browsers in mobile ecosystems. According to data provided to Reuters by six independent browser companies, the DMA's goal to limit unfair competition by making tech companies offer mobile users the ability to select from a list of available web browsers from a choice screen Seems to be working. We've got DuckDuckGo, Brave, Opera, Aloha, Ecosia, and Vivaldi browsers all saying they have increased usage as a result of the DMA going into effect. They've also criticized the rollout of new features saying it could have been handled better, it could have been less convoluted, um, and you know, as a result, maybe we would have even more users. But I think the point, uh, or the takeaway at least, is that when people are given a choice, sometimes they make different choices than just, you, you know, using Chrome, Safari, or uh, Edge. Well, they were always given a choice. Uh, this is about advertising, not choice. You, all, you well, always had yeah. the ability to download a different browser. And I'm talking about the ability to get a different browser that was running on Safari's WebKit engine, not the idea that these browser makers could create their own versions because creating your own version is a separate effect of EU regulation. This is just saying your default browser doesn't have to be Safari. It can be something else. So the choice screen is making all the difference. And it's not surprising to me that if you force every Everyone to be aware that there are multiple browsers that you will see people like experimenting with more browsers like that was the idea of forcing the choice screen and it, it, surprise it, it works it makes people aware that there are browsers they didn't know otherwise i'm sure apps in other categories would love to have a choice screen for their particular app too so they could get the free advertising uh nevertheless the question is is it going to stick it's one thing to let people know like, hey, there's a browser called Vivaldi and then go, huh, that's interesting. I want to give that a shot. Yeah. And them continuing to use Vivaldi and not just going back to Safari. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of people do that. I, I had a weird experience where I kind of thought that would be me. And I ended up sticking with uh, a combination of uh, Firefox and DuckDuckGo for my search engine. And I kind of thought, well... Maybe the browser will stick, but I'll probably bounce around with the search engine. And this isn't really about which search engine, but I didn't bounce back. I stayed. And so that combination has been really good to me. And I don't know that I need anything else. But once in a while, something will come up and they'll go, 
oh, we require Chrome to run this. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, I, ha I have it. And then someone will say, well, sorry, this is Safari only. Well, I have that too. Like, I, I always have about five browsers installed. <laughs> it's just a matter of who's getting a preference. And right now it's all Firefox these days. But I think you're right. I don't even think it's that cynical, Tom. I think people will do this because that's, that's just human behavior. They're used to whatever they're used to. They'll at first go, ooh, choice. And then they'll kind of end up where they're comfortable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> once a year, if not more, uh, the three of us specifically talk about like browsers, you know, let's talk about browsers. What what browsers are we using and why? Mm -hmm. And I go back and forth between Chrome and Firefox. I feel like they're pretty equal for everything that I need. Chrome, you know, is tapped into the you know larger Google Docs ecosystem. So it is advantageous in certain ways. But for the most part, they're kind of the same. I mean, maybe there is a news paywall that I can get around on one browser versus another. So I do tend mm -hmm. to have a few on hand at any given time. But but yeah, it, I think offering people choice is a good thing. That's a good thing. Forcing choice it, because the, you know, the companies, uh, Google, Microsoft and Apple in this scenario are too big. Um, you know, y there are a variety of ways that you can look at it. But I also... I also, I mean, I've I've not heard of, I mean, I've heard of Opera, Vivaldi, and DuckDuckGo. I've not heard of Ecosia. Maybe it's a great browser, you know? Give it a whirl. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for all we know, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we've even talked about it on DTNS a long time ago um, mm. because it, it's it's spin, is, if I remember right, is that it is environmentally friendly. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it means like the more you browse, the more carbon credits they buy, but there's something, there's something like that, like yeah. using sustainable power and, and well, and, and I think, like I that. think browsers, because there are so many to choose from and really it's like, what do you use a browser for? Mostly search, you know, go somewhere that you want to go specifically. You already know where you want to go. You know, the browser isn't doing anything really crazy different, uh, depending on, you know, the browser that you use. Your experience, if it works as advertised, is kind of the same. But they all have their little, like, here's why we're special type thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it's, it's good to know what one you like the best. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my prediction now that a year from now, the European browser market will be mostly dominated by Chrome. Yeah, probably. I think you're probably and not right. Chromium browsers because all of these are Chromium based browsers. I just, I mean, Google's Chrome will still be the dominant. Like, it might drop a couple percentage points, but I think usage wise, people are going to try these different browsers. They're going to run into a situation where their company's, you know, intranet thing or some podcasting tool they use, like we do, or something's just not going to work right, and then they're going to go back to Chrome. Because yep. that seems to be what happens to a lot of people. I give it, uh, I give it the the uh, not only my endorsement, but if there was money involved, I would bet I'd put money down on your color that you've chosen here, or however yeah. it works in gambling. In fact, I don't I'm going to create a, a calendar entry for April 10th, 2025. Do it, do it <laughs> right now. That says uh, check in on. Uh, wow, it's way <laughs> the EU browser market. Yes. Yeah, check in one on one year from today. Let's yeah. all gather back. Yep. April and talk about what we're all using. All day event. Oh, jeez, really? Just it's really hard to create a year in advance in Google Calendar when you don't know what you're doing. Well, all right. Never mind. I'll do that later. <laughs> this is taking too long. Uh, <laughs> what else would you like to hear us talk about on the show than Tom trying to create a calendar appointment in the middle of it? One way to let us know is our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Some internal Microsoft emails that Windows Central just happened to stumble across uh, show that Xbox president Sarah Bond has reiterated plans for a new Xbox, uh, saying in the email, we're moving full speed ahead on our next generation hardware focused on delivering the biggest technological leap ever in a generation. She also touched upon AI's role in future Xbox development and revealed that Microsoft has set up a team to ensure future playability 
compatibility of Xbox games, future forward compatibility of Xbox games, adding, we remain committed to bringing forward the amazing library of Xbox games for future generations of players to enjoy. Scott, that's a nice big pile of tea leaves there in that email. Can you read it? Let's dig down through some of these leaves. Some of them are oak, and that's a problem. Just kidding. All this is fine. Uh, she said something I wanted to address real quick that I haven't really thought about until just now when you when you uh, talked about it again, and that is that this game preservation team, this team that is is there to not only ensure backwards compatibility but some forwards compatibility, I feel like is a very cool thing and very good for the business, but also it's, I wouldn't call it disingenuous, but it's also a little obvious. Uh, and by that I mean the Xbox architecture and even a PlayStation 5's architecture are now fully x86 architecture machines. Moving forward, they are designed to be portable, uh, and by portable, I mean port to other systems, including PCs, this sort of thing. I think their job is easier than ever is what I'm trying to say. They don't have a, a weird you know, power PC chip or something to have to think about 10 years from now. They're going to be kind of in, in a safe area with all this stuff moving forward. So it's not to diminish it. I think it's just the natural way of things. And the fact they have people on it now dedicated, that is a very cool thing. Um, this does This announcement, though, does go kind of counter to all of the assumptions that were being made about a month ago, which were, boy, they're sure talking about services and porting their former exclusives to machines that are competitive for them, like, like PlayStation 5. That must mean, ergo, they're getting out of the hardware market. And this sounds like... They are doing the exact opposite. They are all in on the next round of hardware. And I think that's both interesting and also an opportunity for them because they could really spin the industry on its ear a bit if they really came out of the gate with something much, much more powerful than a normal jump that you would expect for uh, a generational leap. If they can do that and get out ahead of stuff, even if it means taking a loss on hardware sold, which I think they'll do anyway, no matter what, when they launch, um, they've got deep pockets, they can do this. They do run a better chance of giving Sony uh, a harder competitive fight uh, because Sony will be forced to do something similar and Sony doesn't have the same pockets Microsoft has. So we are going to see, I believe, this whatever this next generation looks like, it is going to be the fruition of all of these acquisitions all of these small party or these uh, small developers and big developers and publishers and everything in between that are now housed under the Microsoft Xbox banner, we are going to see all of that come to the table. You're going to see them taking anything they've learned about hardware wars, bringing that to the table. And I still think whatever's next is kind of a switch, a really powerful switch. I think this thing will have a portability aspect to it that you'll walk around with your Game Pass games on. On a and you know installed on a device, sort of Steam Deck wise, that will easily plug into televisions. You know, this is Scott making a lot of predictions here, mm -hmm. but this next run is theirs to lose. I really, really feel strongly that if this is like the moment where Microsoft plants whatever their hopes and dreams are, because you don't spend sixty-seven million on one uh, group of developers plus uh, you know umpte umpteen millions and billions of dollars more on others without having a moment like what's coming for them. And I and I feel positive about it, like what it will actually do for them, but they've got to nail it. They have to learn all the lessons from the Xbox One era and what happened there, uh, coming in so strong in the 360 and then losing all that footing uh, to Sony. And even though there's not a giant gap between sales for the two, uh, you know, the, for Sony and Microsoft, the two big names right now, there's a lot on the line in terms of future brand recognition and acceptance. And this is their chance to either totally run away with this or blow it completely. And I can't wait. I'm going to be on the sidelines watching this whole thing. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I, I think Microsoft continues to prove that the simplistic corporations are always greedy and will think short term uh, doesn't always work. Uh, I don't think Microsoft is doing any of these moves because they're good people, although they probably are. That's not why they're doing it. They're doing these moves because they make business sense. Uh, good business thinks long term. Good business treats its customers well. The businesses that don't do that and are, you know, profit taking and short term, 
generally don't last all that long. And so I, I look at this and people are like, well, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that they're committed to continuing to make consoles. Like, no, look at them continuing to make Surface machines. It's a demonstration of what their stuff can do. And it acknowledges that there's still a lot of console players out there that like playing consoles. And the fact that there were a lot of people mad that they might lose consoles shows that. So I, I, I think this is good for us to note uh, continually that you, these companies that do well uh, pay attention and are creative and come up with ways of making money, even when they're self-interested, uh, that end up benefiting consumers. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that take. And um, it also probably seals the deal on the idea that we're not going to get a mid-generation bump from them, like a, an Xbox One Pro or like an Xbox Slim or something. <laughs> they may do a Slim. Slims are always possible, right? Yeah, I guess um, so. Yeah. Technically, the S is sort of already slim. Sure, but, that's what uh, the S is for. I have a fe- I have a feeling like my, there there's pretty good <laughs> intel on Sony coming out with a PlayStation 5 Pro uh, like they did last generation. They may do one of those again. I think this says pretty clearly that Microsoft's not playing that game this time. I don't think either company benefited that much from the mid uh, the mid generation bump, and uh, I could be dead wrong on that, but I don't think it actually really shifted the landscape much. Um, and a lot of players were just like, oh, "I'll stick with what I got. I'm not spending another six hundred dollars." Uh, so now my mind turns to, well, what are they going to do next? What does that look like? What are these specs? Uh, what are the innovations? I won't say revolutions because we're kind of past that point. This is all going to be about innovation and how many teraflops you can produce uh, with new hardware. And we'll find out probably, given her talking right now and giving all this this stuff, we could hear as early as this fall uh, on what this plan might be. They could get out ahead of it and maybe even beat Sony to the punch. This this is my favorite part of a generation's uh, yeah. turn is just all this like the crazy do speculation first? phase. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's like sports. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, and 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 just one little button on this conversation. It should not be lost that that memo was talking about future compatibility because Microsoft still believes that cross-platform uh, cloud-based computing is going to be where they make a large portion of their money in the future. So I, it, it, do, it does tell me that they are seeing gaming as a service and they're not abandoning hardware because of that. They're seeing hardware as a way to feature their service. There you go. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Ken, who says, I'm a pretty recent acquired viewer. I came over from Android Faithful and had to chime in on the EV debate. We talked to Chris Ashley about this on Monday. Uh, Ken says, I live in a fairly rural area of New York near Buffalo and commute typically around 70 to 80 miles per day. In the two years I've driven an EV, I've taken a few longer trips, which is a 2021 Hyundai Kona EV, typically rated at about 230 to 250 miles per charge. The idea of taking longer trips in one of these, not for everyone. Around us, we have some of the open networked Tesla superchargers, which have lent significantly decreased um, uh, a lot of people's range anxiety. And, Ken says, I can see where other manufacturers have made their switch over to the NACS standard, and they're free to use the Tesla superchargers. This will significantly help with the range anxiety concept, as they have a much more robust network than Electrify America or ChargePoint or Green Lots, to name a few. Ken says, personally, I head up to northern Ontario, Canada, a few times per year. I found it takes me about mm, 20 to 30 minutes for most of my charge stops, which is usually enough to grab a coffee or a snack, run to the restroom. If you're lucky enough to stop and charge in South River, Ontario, you can run into the brewery and have a local craft brew and an order of nachos. By the time I'm back in the car, it's time to go. The downside is having to contend with broken stations or stations that are down for upgrades, something that can always be a roll of the dice. I look forward to the day where these are always consistently reliable and an enjoyable experience for all. Ah, thank you, Ken. Uh, and good to have you along uh, with the rest of the DTNS yeah, folks. Everyone's yeah. always welcome to join uh, the DTNS crowd. So good to have new people. I loved this response because it was someone who's enthusiastic, but also realistic to say like, hey, yeah, it isn't perfect. These are some of the challenges, but I'm also able to drive up to Northern Ontario with my EV and it's not, you know, it's not a disaster. So I think that a lot of the varying uh, perspectives on EVs and range particularly are differences between planners 
and pantsers, as they call it in writing. Pantsers just start writing by the seat of their pants and just like see what comes next. Planners like write an outline and like write to that outline. I think planners pref are fine with EVs because they're used to like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'll plan my supercharger route and I'll figure out where it is. Pantsers see this as a nightmare. Like, wait, I can't just wait until I see the next charger and then pull I'm going to go and ahead and it. guess that you're a planner, Tom. Uh, I would be a pantser. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Yeah. 100% of the time where I'm just like, not even worth it. It's going to be, we're going to go sideways. I, yeah. I will run out of energy. Yeah. And 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 EVs are not really optimal for that 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 kind of approach, right? So yeah. we'll, we'll get there. But uh, thank you, Ken, uh, for writing in. Also, thanks to Chip from Boston, Dean, Andrew, Sakani, Tim, and Michael, who also weighed in with very excellent perspectives by email. Appreciated those emails as well. Indeed, yeah. Thanks, everybody. We we love when a story resonates. So keep the feedback coming. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Um, also, Scott Johnson, please keep coming back to the show because we like you a lot. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Man, I was this close to never coming again. But now you've said that, wow. I think I'm well, coming Well, I felt it. Yeah. And now you're locked. Well, now I'm, now I'm locked in. Well, I may as well tell you about another show I do. I do a show called Core. We do it on Thursday nights. It is all about big focus on video game stuff. And this will definitely be a discussion this week. We're going to talk about the potential of new Microsoft hardware, what Sony might do in response, maybe what Nintendo's got right around the corner. If all of those things are always interesting to you, you might like that show. That's at frogpants.com slash core. And just look for core wherever you get your shows. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. You're always welcome to become a patron. Come on, everybody wants you. Get on in here, patreon.com slash DTNS. Today on the extended show, could a video game developer win the Nobel Prize for Literature? A professor of humanities has argued the answer is yes, and we're going to talk about whether we agree with him. Reminder, our show is live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. What will we talk about then? You'll have to tune in to find out. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>